Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our distinguished guest today is the international jurist Richard Goldstone. He has served his country and the international community uh, through many positions, three of which I would like to highlight. He was a justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. He served as chief prosecutor of the United Nations International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia. And most recently, he was head of a UN fact-finding mission on Gaza established by the president of the United Nations Human Rights Council. And finally, uh, in the period of transition from apartheid, he served as chairperson of the Commission of Inquiry regarding public violence and intimidation. Justice Goldstone, welcome back to our program. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Uh, what are the lessons of South Africa's successful transition uh, to democracy that might be relevant for today? Well, I think, I think there are two lessons that, that come to mind immediately. The one is the tremendous importance of good leaders. I think this, the, we, we wouldn't have had a relatively peaceful transition without the extraordinary leadership uh, capabilities of Nelson Mandela on the one side and F.W. de Klerk on the other. And we were lucky to have both interacting with each other at the same time in history. Uh, so, 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 so leadership is, is very important and of course and in, it become interesting with regard to the recent events in Egypt, what sort of leadership is going to emerge out of the present semi-chaotic situation. Uh, the, the, the other lesson I've learned is that never say never. If you would have asked me uh, in 1990, at the beginning of 1990, what the prospects were of a relatively peaceful transition from oppressive, racist minority government uh, to, to a majority uh, democracy uh, based on non-racism and non-sexism, um, I, I, I would have said just about zero. Uh, so I think, I think one, one, one shouldn't be too pessimistic. Thing, things change quickly. Uh, how important uh, was it that in the case of South Africa there was an Anglo uh, Saxon legal tradition, really, which you were a part of. So the law was evolving at the edges uh, of the jurisprudence that at the same time was a pillar of the apartheid regime. Now, well, it was important. We, we, we had an egalitarian common law. The Roman Dutch common law was recognized equality and freedoms and so on. And really, apartheid legislation was one inroad after the other into, uh, I into that. But apartheid, like, like, like Nazism, was ruled by law. There was a rule by law, not a rule of law. Uh, but nevertheless, within the white minority community, uh, the, the, there was an independent judiciary. Um, the, the law was respected by the, by the apartheid rulers. So it was, as Alan Drury put it many years ago, it was a very strange society. It was a semi-police state, but we had open courts and, and, and pretty open media with criticism. So the, the, the role the law played was important too. It, it was important in another respect. The Afrikaans leaders, all, virtually all came from a very narrow Calvinist approach where there was respect for education and respect for the law. So, so judges were able to play an important role in beginning to blunt some of the rough edges of apartheid during the last decade and a half, from, from really from the middle of, uh, of the 1970s. And, and they could get away with it because of the respect for, for the judiciary. So, so, so we did have the advantage of, 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 of keeping the flame of justice barely alive during apartheid but it, really re it was really reignited in the democratic era. And, and in, in terms of your personal background, you, uh, as a, a, a student, were uh, exposed to the, the uh, oppressive nature of apartheid. 
uh, as you watch your fellow black students have very different circumstances. Talk a little about that, because what, what's interesting in your career is this dynamic of, of somebody who sees the, uh, the problems, but then is committed uh, professionally uh, to uh, uh, work that gives you the opportunity to sort of change the system through yeah. law. Well, well, I, I came from a f fairly typical white, upper-middle-class Jewish family. Uh, I, I didn't meet black people as equals in my, in my parents' home. My parents opposed racism, but they weren't activists at all. Uh, and the result was that I just grew up accepting, as one does, one, 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 when one's young, one, one accepts one's own surroundings as representing the world. And uh, I suppose fairly late in the day when I became a, a student at Witwatersrand University when I, was, when I was 17, I was suddenly exposed to meeting black South Africans as equals and became very quickly angry, disaffected and frustrated at the unfairness of racism and the different worlds in which I lived as a young white student and the world, the horrible world they had to live in because of the apartheid laws. Uh, in, uh, in a very different world, and that, that really got me involved uh, in my very, from my earliest university days in, uh, in, in, in student anti-apartheid activism, and soon rose to become the, 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 the president of the Students' Council. The main political activity was to, to fight apartheid, particularly in education. And then as a lawyer, and on the bench as a, as a, as a justice, uh, uh, in, in an appeals court, you were presented with cases that, that allowed you to say, okay, if this is the law, then, then uh, what does the fair implementation of that uh, law involve? So the, the, the famous case is the Govender case, uh, which, which really uh, began the process of overturning apartheid. Mm -hmm. Well, well, really, there, there's an American background to this. In 1979, the United States, some United States foundations and leading civil rights workers, particularly uh, Professor Jack Greenberg now, who was then the director of the Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP, attended an important first ever human rights conference in Cape Town. Uh, as I say, it was an American initiative, and born at that conference were two crucial organizations. One was Lawyers for Human Rights, which provided th many thousands of pro bono defenses for black South Africans in the uh, following years. And perhaps more importantly, from a historical and from an effectiveness point of view, the Legal Resources Center, which was based on the Legal Defense Fund. And its first national director was one of our leading uh, advocates, our leading attorneys, Arthur Chaskelson, uh, who, who took two years leave of absence and stayed for 14 <laughs> years, at the end of which uh, Nelson Mandela, President Nelson Mandela, then appointed him as our first post-apartheid Chief Justice. And I was uh, privileged and honored to serve under him on the Constitutional Court of South Africa. But the Legal Resources Center started bringing cases to court using, using the courts really to give a benevolent interpretation to, to many of the ambiguous apartheid laws. The, the, the pro-apartheid judges fell on deaf ears, but there were sufficient of us and we were encouraged, those who were against apartheid were encouraged when we were offered appointments to the, to, to the bench to accept them. And, 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 and really there were, I guess, maybe eight, nine, ten more, uh, more uh, liberal uh, judges during that period who, 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 who were able to make a difference, and uh, it, it, it was a great privilege for me to be one of them. This is interesting because now as we're seeing what's happening in the Arab world, the, the, and, the, and the, the, the craving for democracy within many uh, countries uh, in, in that region on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, an uncertainty about how America, the United States, <coughs> should help in the process. Uh, and and uh, 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 with the Bush administration 
push democratization and, and helping to build institutions. What, what is the, in your view, the interface here where uh, this outside help uh, has positive outcomes versus a situation where it's it's meddling and so on. Right. What, what made the difference in South Africa, that you had a kind of an institutional base that was open to, to learning how to do things? Well, I, I think what was important uh, in, in South Africa was that we were able to manage our transition ourselves. There were sufficient South Africans, black, white, and Asian, who were able to become involved in the transition. Um, on, on the side of democracy and the side of the rule of law. And I think that made a difference because to, to really to, to, to have a democracy, you need a culture of democracy. People have to understand what their rights are. You can't enforce and enjoy your rights if you don't know what they are. And we were lucky to have uh, black leaders who understood human rights. Uh, Mandela and uh, his colleagues took the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to prison with them. It was their, it was their Bible, so to speak. So, so they, they wanted democracy in the, uh, in, the, in the sense that you and I, and Americans in particular, uh, understand by democracy, and Western Europe understands by democracy. Because one has elections doesn't mean you have a democracy. I mean, after all, Hitler was elected. Mugabe was elected, Milosevic was elected, but they turned their countries into oppressive, police, undemocratic societies. So it's not sufficient to have elections. You need much more than that. You need respect for the institutions. You need respect for the rule of law. You need a, a, a people who, who, who appreciate their rights and are prepared to fight for it. I mean, it, 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 it's true in, the, uh, in, uh, in Gaza and the West Bank. They've had elections. But, but you don't have any, any true democracy. And this is one of the problems that, that will have to uh, be, 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 be looked at very carefully in any future settlement and dispensation uh, in the Middle East. Uh, so, so I think, I think it's, it's, it's South Africa was fortunate in that we had that culture built up uh, uh, over the years and it's continued. Uh, the jury's still out, there's still problems. There's always the tension between majoritarianism, the majority of the people object to unelected judges uh, uh, setting aside on review uh, decisions, legislation passed by a majority parliament. But so far, I'm happy to say, and, 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 and South Africa has been blessed with governors, uh, with, with, with leaders who, who, who respect the law and, uh, and, uh, and have implemented uh, pretty meticulously uh, decisions that have gone against them uh, in, uh, in the courts. And you, that's the sort of culture one needs. And the United States can assist in creating, it's education in the end. People have to be educated to understand their rights and particularly human rights and not to, not to abuse them, but to use them. And, and, and certainly in South Africa, the United States uh, and Western European powers, other democracies, uh, played a very important role in, 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 in being role models and sending, sending assistance to South Africans who were doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, you, uh, in, in the period when uh, uh, the last phase of apartheid, you were appointed uh, to head a commission uh, of inquiry regarding public violence and intimidation. And that commission uh, looked, did fact-finding, and made rulings on uh, situations that made the possibility of democracy v very vulnerable. Uh, what, what do you draw from that particular phase, which then transitioned to a, a, a truth and a reconciliation uh, uh, body uh, after uh, uh, the end of apartheid, that, that we need institutions and leaders that can point out the wrongs that are being done or were done, and a, a process of the, the, the victim and the oppressor sort of finding a common meeting ground? Uh, well, it, it, really, the commission in South Africa that I chaired uh, grew out of a surprising situation 
It was assumed that after the, the release of Mandela and the other black leaders who had been sentenced to, to life imprisonment, they'd been in prison for 27 years, it was assumed that when they were released and their previously banned organizations were, were, were made lawful, that there would be a, a, a pretty peaceful transition. Both sides wanted to end up with a democracy. But to, to the surprise, not only of South Africans, but the world, Violence increased, and between in, in the four years of our transition, something between 10 and 15,000 people were killed in, in, in political violence. So it, it, it's wrong. They were, one often hears about the peaceful transition in South Africa. It wasn't that peaceful. It was relatively peaceful, and certainly peaceful in comparison to the bloodbath that we were heading for had apartheid not been abandoned. But there was violence, and there were schools of there were two schools of thought as to the cause of the violence white leaders disparagingly referred to it as black on black violence because it was black people killing black people and it was mainly supporters of nelson mandela's african national congress at war with 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 the supporters of uh, chief butelezi's and carter freedom movement who were really a zulu mainly tribal uh, 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 movement and the, the, the thesis of Mandela was that this violence was being fermented, was being instigated by what he called a third force. It was being instigated by elements in the army and the police, with or without the, the, the encouragement or the knowledge indeed of the white leaders of de Klerk and his people. But that was the cause. And the reason they wanted to ferment the violence was to <coughs> avoid the successful negotiations and to continue the apartheid system under which, of course, they benefited. And it was in those circumstances that it was agreed by all of the parties to the peace accord. All of the, the, the black and white leaders, there were about, there were 19 different political groups in the peace accord. And they agreed that there would be a judicial commission to investigate the causes of the violence, but only on condition that the chairperson and the four members were chosen unanimously by all 19 parties. And in particular, it was the, the, the government and the African National Congress that had to agree. And, 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 and I was approached after two months of negotiations uh, behind closed doors to say that, that it had been agreed that I should lead this. It was a very difficult decision whether to do it because I knew this was going to be a very politically charged, difficult, difficult job. But I felt I had a duty to do it, and, and, and in fact, we were able to, to, to establish, we, we had our own investigation units, the international community played a huge role in recognizing the importance of what we were doing. So we had quite a lot of political clout. We, were, we not only got our own investigators, we got foreign uh, le uh, leading police officers to come and assist us. We had leading South African lawyers assisting us. And we used the, the unusual powers. I had powers of search and seizure and powers to subpoena people to, who, under threat of imprisonment, had to give evidence. But we, we, in the end, established that Nelson Mandela was absolutely correct. There was a third force being organized primarily in the South African military. Uh, and that, 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 that exposure certainly helped pave the way for, for a more peaceful uh, a negotiation, but importantly, it paved the way for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if one looks at the current situation, for example, in Egypt, one, uh, I, I have not yet heard the notion that there might be such uh, a, a commission uh, to look at uh, uh, the injustices and crimes uh, of, say, the last uh, uh, 30 years. Uh, if, if that were to emerge as an issue, what, what should uh, be looked for in the way of an environment in which the possibility of what you achieved in South Africa with these commissions uh, uh, recurring in Egypt? It's very difficult to compare the South African situation to the Egyptian. I'm sure there are more differences than similarities. And it, it was encouraging to read yesterday in the newspaper that, that the uh, present military leaders uh, have, uh, are, are busy setting up a committee to draft a democratic constitution for, for Egypt. 
that's the starting. That's the starting point, and uh, it, it, it was certainly the, the, the starting point uh, in South Africa that there were these negotiations uh, to have a, dem a, a democratic constitution, uh, the, the world's most still, I think, the world's most modern, very broad bill of rights. Um, the uh, powers, powers of the courts to 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 to, to implement the the constitution to test legislation. Obviously, if, if Egypt is to be a true democracy, that is necessary. What you do about the past is very much a political question. Um, the, I'm, I'm sure there are many in the military in, in Egypt, as there were in the military in South Africa. The last thing they want is too is too close a look into what happened in the past. Uh, it's, it's difficult to move forward and to have reconciliation if the past is hidden. And that was the attitude of Nelson Mandela. He wasn't prepared simply to forget the past, to have what, what was often referred to as national amnesia. Uh, but at the same time, it should be borne in mind that the Truth Commission followed more than a year after we had democratic government. Mandela was astute. He realized that a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa was not popular with the old guard military. And, and he astutely, in my view, waited on my, as I interpret it, he waited until he had satisfied himself that he really had control of the army and the police. There wasn't a great chance of a military coup in South Africa, but it wasn't out of the question, could have happened. And, and so, so it was a question of hastening slowly. And, and, and how this will work out in Egypt, I think, I, I certainly don't know enough about the internal dynamics. Uh, but but if, if, if a Truth and Reconciliation Commission is politically, economically, and militarily uh, on uh, 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 something that could happen in Egypt, it would certainly be for the benefit of the people of Egypt. Uh, there, there's one other element that uh I don't think exists, well, it, the technology that exists today seems to be adding a new dynamic. Absolutely. Uh, in South Africa, of course, there was international pressure. There, were, there was a movement uh, throughout the Western world to, to end apartheid. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the, 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 the implications of the technology? Because really, the, to, to transition to democracy really requires institution, the evolution of law. And, and technology, on the other hand, is, is bringing new ideas very quickly, uh, and there may not be the institutional base for implementing the best ideas. No, no I think, I think what, what certainly I haven't been able to grasp, and I think many people haven't been able to grasp, and I think a lot of people are looking into it and talking about it, is, is, is the effect of modern technology, of Facebook and Twitter and all of the things that you and I knew nothing about not too long ago, uh, is, 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 is hastening the process. Everything is speeding up as a result of instant uh, communications. And it's something certainly that, 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 that is different in South Africa, as you say, uh, it, 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 wasn't, it, it wasn't as advanced, but people, people knew what happened through television. You know, until, until the 1960s, the leaders of apartheid uh, d didn't allow television in South Africa. They didn't want the majority of our people to see what was happening in the rest of the world. So the, the rest of the world was kept out, and they could do that. Uh, it, it, the the uh, Mubarak tried to do that by closing down the internet. It didn't work because there were other forms of technology that allowed the word to get out. Uh, iPhones and, 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 and various other means of, of, of uh, satellite phones of sending the information out. So, so that has changed. And that's a good thing because it's, 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 it seems to me it's, 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 it's on the side of democratization it's on the side of opening up and transparency uh, that, that that's, it, 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 it's really a very new world and it has different consequences politically and, and practically. Uh, in the South African case, you were involved in helping to shape the norms as South Africa transitioned from the apartheid regime to, uh, to the end of apartheid and democracy. Now, in, in the, the next 
Well, not yeah. The next job that you had moved you to to the international stage, and I want to talk a little about that. Your role as special prosecutor. Let me show your book for humanity's reflections of a war crimes uh, investigator, and uh, I, w I want to talk about what was different in uh, dealing with the war crimes in Bosnia and Rwanda in terms of your leadership role, because you've now moved from the national setting, where there's some institutional base, to uh, the international one, where, where there's the beginning of a base. Right. W what was the biggest challenge? Well, firstly, the biggest difference. In South Africa, I had the full support and cooperation of all the political parties. Uh, the African National Congress, the still apartheid government of de Klerk, the police, uh, e uh, even the, the, the army, Butelezi, all of them cooperated in the sense that we, we, we held over 40 discrete investigations into violence over a period of three years. All of the major parties were there. They gave us their views. Their, 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 their supporters gave evidence. So, so, so we, had, we had that support. Had one of the major parties pulled out, it would have been the end of our commission. It would have lost credibility. It couldn't have really done its work in the same way. And uh, part of the success was based on keeping that coalition together. And that could only be done by being absolutely transparent. I used to have just about weekly meetings with, 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 with Nelson Mandela long before he was president. Uh, because it was important, I felt, as the obvious future leader, that he knew what we were doing. And it, 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 it was, one had to be politically astute, I suppose, in order to keep that coalition together and not to do things as it were behind closed doors. Uh, in the case of becoming chief prosecutor of the Yugoslavia tribunal, it was very different because two of the three major players, Serbia and Croatia, were not on board at all. They rejected the Security Council setting up the, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. The Serbs in particular regarded this as a United States tool uh, which was anti-Serb and, and the war was still ongoing. And the, the issue is in that sort of situation the Security Council felt that establishing the facts, establishing justice, would assist reconciliation and help bring the, the war to an end. If I can jump ahead for a moment, it did in a, in a most unexpected way. When, when I indicted uh, Radovan, uh, Radovan Karadic uh, in, the, in, in the middle of 1995, little could anybody have anticipated that, the, that Richard Holbrook would, would, would put together the Dayton meeting which put an end to the war, nobody could have anticipated that the indictment of Karadic enabled Dayton to happen. If, if, if Karadic had not been indicted, there would have been no meeting at Dayton because the, the, the Bosnians wouldn't have been there. Remember, it was two months after the terrible massacre at Srebrenica. So, so, so it did have that effect, but that wasn't because the parties wanted it, but it was because the United Nations and the attitude of the judges and certainly my own attitude was that the opposition from Serbia and from Croatia shouldn't, ha shouldn't have the effect of a veto over the work of the tribunal uh, and, we went, and, and we went ahead in the face of their opposition. So in South Africa we had everybody on board, in the former Yugoslavia we didn't and we had to use other tools and other avenues to ensure that, that the work proceeded and was as, as, as successful as possible. Now, ironically, uh, some would say, well, you shouldn't indict because it will interfere with the political process. But what you're suggesting is that a commitment to law and to the development of, of a judicial process moves ahead into the future. And, and, and in this particular case, serendipity made that a, a, a benefit for the possibility of a peace accord. Absolutely, and one couldn't, one couldn't see it without, without a very good crystal ball. One, one, one could never know, but I think, I think it does indicate that, that, that prosecutors, I believe, Shouldn't shouldn't tailor what they do by the 
reports of what's happening with negotiations and what's happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I support fully the decision of, of, of Moreno Ocampo in indicting President al-Bashir of the Sudan. If, if that's where the evidence leads, that's the way the prosecutor must go. And I don't believe prosecutors have the information. They're not privy to negotiations. Uh, they don't have the advice to, to take political decisions. That's not what they're there to do. They're there to investigate, and if the evidence justifies it, uh, to, to prosecute. And, and so the, the, the notion in, in these tribunals of fact-finding, of uh, setting up uh, the capacity to find out what the story is, has a, a twofold benefit. One is you've, you've written often about the, uh, the, the notion of listening to the victims of oppression, recording the stories, what happened to them, uh, creating a body of evidence that says this was done by X or Y or Z. Hmm. But, but in addition, you're suggesting that you also serve the long-term purpose of, of producing a, a new set of norms, right. really. And, and, and really, there are different mechanisms. The, the South African Commission wasn't judicial. Hmm. We, we couldn't indict anybody if we found evidence of criminality, and we did. We, we referred that to the public prosecutor, to the National Prosecuting Authority, and uh, he or she took decisions as to whether to, 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 in, to have police investigations and whether to indict, and some did. One of the, most, one of the worst criminals, uh, whose nickname became Prime Evil, uh, is serving life in prison for murders and frauds that he committed as a leading South African police officer, uh, torturing people, murdering people uh, dur during the apartheid regime, during the apartheid era. Uh, and th that came directly out of our investigations. But that wasn't our decision. We investigated the facts to the best of our ability and handed, and, and it was referred uh, firstly in a report to the president and then to the, uh, to, to the prosecutor. In the former Yugoslavia situation, I was the prosecutor. The investigations were different, and the investigations were done to establish whether, whether we had enough evidence uh, in, uh, in order to, to indict. So that, that was a, th th there was a different process that, uh, that, uh, that, that was at issue. But, but, but in the end, uh, all our justice mechanisms in the sense of justice being being there to bring acknowledgement to the victims. That is what victims want. They want official acknowledgement of what happened to them. After all, they, they know what happened to them. They, in South Africa, the victims of apartheid, did, did, didn't need our commission to tell them what happened to them. What was important, we forced white South Africans to, 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 to see it. To use Desmond Tutu's expression, it forced them to look the devil in the eye. That, 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 that helped reconciliation, and it, 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 it led, as I say, to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And its benefit is to give South Africa one history of what happened. In the former Yugoslavia, even though we had the difficulties of lack of cooperation and worse from, from Serbia and to, to, to a lesser extent, but still a material one from Croatia, um, there, the, the, there the fact that emerged at the trials established uh, the, the, the facts of what happened and, and helped bring acknowledgement to the victims using a different, a different process, using a judicial process as opposed to the process in South Africa, which, which was really not judicial at all. Now, in, in this role, you really wound up because you were building institutions, uh, uh, scrambling for money. Uh, doing uh, a lot of the political groundwork to establish the legitimacy because this was a, a process that was starting from the ground up. Right. Now, one thing that I learned in South Africa, and I think we were fairly successful, was that in order to have legitimacy, we, we had to be transparent. We had to tell people what we were doing. Uh, and of course, what was important in South Africa, all of our investigations were held to the extent feasible where the violence occurred. We, we, we moved to the people. We, we didn't sit in court buildings many miles away from where these things happened. We sat in 
uh, local halls on occasions and in church buildings and so on, uh, w w w which made the people feel part of the whole process, and that, that was important. In the case of the former Yugoslavia, we couldn't do that. We couldn't have trials in, in, uh, in Bosnia. Uh, it would have been too dangerous. There would have been security issues. Serbia and Croatia wouldn't have allowed it anyway. So we had to have it hundreds, hundreds of miles away in The Hague, which, which is less effective and one of the downsides of the Yugoslavia tribunals and justifiable criticisms is that it didn't really impact directly uh, on the people uh, who, who were the immediate victims. It got to them eventually, but it, wasn't, it didn't have that personal, personal impact, which is a pity, but it's inevitable. But one of the things certainly that, that I learned in South Africa that I took with me to, to the former Yugoslavia was the importance of being transparent, particularly with the media. The media play a crucial role in, in, in the success or the failure of these institutions. If I wasn't able to get the media on my side in the, in the South African Commission, we would have failed. And I realized when we got to the former Yugoslavia that the international and uh, local media had written off the Yugoslavia tribunal. Uh, uh, I, I, I remember Mark Wallace in 60 Minutes. Uh, the, the first thing I did when I arrived in The Hague uh, was an interview for Mark Wallace and the segment on the Yugoslavia tribunal uh, was, 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 was called a, an act of hypocrisy. <laughs> uh, it, it was a very negative uh, approach and, and at the time justified and I realized that if we were going to get money if we were going to get support, uh, we, had to get, we had to get media support and it was very important to be transparent and explain what our problems were, what we were going to do to tackle them, and as we went along to give information uh, that was consistent with, 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 with protecting the work that we were doing. And, and one of your uh, problems was the lack of an enforcement uh, arm when, uh, in the case of some of these indictments, the, the, uh, the uh, allies and the military forces were really uh, reluctant to act for political reasons, uh, although they claimed there were military reasons, when it uh, required them to actually right. capture the indicted. Well, of course, this is, this is probably the biggest single problem of international justice, is getting orders enforced. No international court uh, has ever had or will ever have in, 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 in the foreseeable future its own police force and army. So when, when warrants of arrest are issued, uh, they, they have to be carried out by national uh, uh, authorities. And, and that was the problem because Serbia and Croatia refused to uh, uh, carry out the, the orders and requests of the Yugoslavia Tribunal. And when the, when the United Nations sent in their troops, as what was called UNPROFOR, the United Nations Protecting Force, uh, and w which eventually the United States joined uh, in, in 1995, uh, the, the attitude, I, I just assumed, naively in retrospect, I assumed that, that the United Nations armies, the troops, would arrest the people who we indicted. But, but they refused. They, they were very upfront about it. They said, this is mission creep, was the, was the uh, f uh, f famous phrase used, that they're not police officers, they're army officers, it's not their job to arrest people. Um, they, they, they sort of compromised. They said, if somebody falls into our hands, we'll arrest them, but we're not going to go out looking for them. And it was fairly notorious uh, at that time that Karadic and Maladic used to go through roadblocks and not be, not be arrested. And I remember discussing it at, at, at least two meetings I had with the then Secretary, Def uh, Secretary for Defense, William Perry, during the uh, uh, Clinton administration. Uh, and, and he was, again, very upfront. And his attitude was that, I agree with you. I think, I think these arrests should be made. But, 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 and, but, 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 uh, but the, this administration, he said, the Clinton administration, is not going to buck the will of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and that was the political reality. And that, that only began to change when, the, when there were changes in Europe, when, when uh, Tony Blair's Labour government came into, uh, came into power, uh, the, the Conservative government of, 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 of John Major wasn't prepared to assist us. The Blair government was. And Klaus Kinkel, when he was Foreign Minister of Germany, 
went out of his way to assist us. So it was, it was, it's all politics. And, and, and when political leaders uh, decided that, that these people were to be arrested, arrest, arrest started. It was after my term of office ended, but when my successor, Louise Arbour, was there, uh, many arrests happened and trial, trials got underway. Uh, so there is a politics of international justice, and what, what in your mind stands out as the most difficult task? Well, international justice is all about politics. I, I, I've been teaching international criminal law at American law schools, and at every class I point out to, to, to the students that if you don't understand the politics of international justice, you really don't in understand international justice at all. Uh, it, it, without the right politics, these courts wouldn't have been created. Without the political will of the United States, there wouldn't have been a Yugoslavia tribunal. Without the political will of the United States that had to overcome Churchill's resistance, there wouldn't have been a Nuremberg trial. And without the political push, including, ironically, the United States, we wouldn't have a permanent international criminal court. And if that court is going to succeed, and it's still really in its infancy, it will depend on the political will of the countries that support it. Happily, by my lights, 114 nations are behind it. The United States is moving more and more to assist that court. I think it's a long way from joining, but I think, I think we're going through a period, which I hope will continue, of assisting the international court. But it's all, it, it's all politics as to whether the, the, these institutions are created, and it's all politics as to the extent to which they succeed. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting at all, in fact, to the contrary, that the prosecutor or the judges should have a political agenda. That's a different issue completely, mm -hmm. and they shouldn't. They should be apolitical, and they should do their professional duty in an honest, transparent, and unbiased way. Uh, the post-9-11 world is one in which uh, terrorism is a central feature, and the argument is made that terrorists and non-governmental actors uh, uh, like uh, al-Qaeda play by different rules. What is the challenge of international law adjusting to uh, new situations where the enemy is not a standing army of another country? Well, the biggest challenge is how to, to, to fight a war against non-state actors, terrorists if you wish, but they're really not, not armies in the traditional sense. The, the, the challenge is how to fight against them without unnecessarily jeopardizing and killing and injuring innocent civilians um, amongst whom they very often hide. That, that is the challenge. But I believe the law, the law is clear that civilians have to be protected to the extent that, the, that military justifica, uh, justification makes possible. Uh, to, to give you just, to, to just one example, uh, if, 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 if terrorists are firing rockets from the top of a crowded hospital and there are three or four terrorists doing that, uh, it, 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 it wouldn't, as I understand the law, be justified to bomb the hospital, kill the four terrorists, and at the same time kill 3,000 patients who are completely innocent. Uh, on the other hand, if, if terrorists are firing uh, uh, rockets or mortars from, from the backyard of a house in which there happen to be two or three civilians, uh, it may well be justified to kill two or three civilians in order to stop the, 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 the rocket fire. So it's all, it's all a question of, firstly, the fundamental principle recognized by all decent armies of distinction. You have to distinguish between combatants on the one hand and innocent non-belligerent civilians on the other, and proportionality. Uh, and, and, and often, and I think one must recognize, it's often a very difficult call to make uh, on the spur of the moment. But, but in many cases, commanders don't have to make sudden decisions. Policy has to be worked out. There are rules of engagement which, which armies have and which change uh, from time to time. But, but, but that is the challenge. It's, 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 a, it's a different challenge from 
the 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 challenge of fighting against a regular a regular army where 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 the demarcation uh, is uh, is a lot easier but nonetheless the law is there and it has to be it has to be respected and it has to be applied and if it's been violated there should be consequences uh, your your most recent assignment <coughs> was head of the uh, UN uh, commission to look at the Gaza war and one of the problems that you confronted was the political choice of the Israeli government not to participate. Uh, talk a little about that, because that, that is a, a stumbling block that you mentioned previously. That is, how do you get the actors to be part of a process where there can be judicious and fair fact-finding uh, with regard to the problem before us? Right. Well, it, 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 it was similar to Yugoslavia from that, from that respect, not, not having the cooperation of all the parties. Let, let me say that when I went into this, I really assumed that the Israeli government would cooperate. Uh, I, I insisted on getting a mandate that would entitle us to look at all violations on all sides. And I had already previously rejected a mandate that was that was only to look at Israeli violations. I said that's not. I'm, I'm not prepared to get involved with that. And and having got from the president of the Human Rights Council a, a mandate which which enabled us and did enable us and we did look at violations on all sides. I I assumed that the Israeli government would cooperate. I thought this was an opportunity for them, for the first time to cooperate with an even-handed resolution from the United Nations. Because, let's face it, the, 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 the Israelis have had a raw deal from the UN. Uh, they've given, the, the, the UN has given uh, an unbelievable uh, amount of attention uh, to, to alleged violations uh, by Israel, um, and at the same time ignored or downplayed uh, uh, equally, equally serious, and in some cases far more serious uh, violations uh, on the other side. I mean, one has it right at the moment with Sri Lanka, uh, where 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 the where the Human Rights Council has refused to set up a fact-finding mission. So I understand with sympathy the political um, knee-jerk reaction on the part of Israel not to cooperate with the United Nations. But it seemed to me, having regard to my own uh, it, uh, past of being involved with uh, with Israel, with organisations, working working in Israel, uh, uh, with with my South African involvement in the uh, in the Jewish community, and having got the even-handed mandate, I perhaps naively, but I did assume that there would be cooperation. It took it took some months of uh, uh, after I'd sent pleading letters. Uh, I mean, for example, I asked the. The, the Israeli government to meet with me, to advise me how to go about this fact-finding mission, uh, to, to give me advice as to who, where, where to look, and I, I assumed would be allowed to go into southern Israel and have a look at the damage done by uh, the firing of many thousands of rockets and mortars to investigate, to investigate that, to talk to victims. Um, and of course, that, 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 that cooperation was eventually refused after three letters, which I sent two to the Israeli ambassador in Geneva and one to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, by then, the, 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 the train had left the station and the investigation was underway. But I was pretty much in the situation that I was in the uh, Yugoslavia situation of not having the cooperation of all the parties. And, and I believe that it was important, and I hope that we succeeded in being transparent and explaining what we were doing, who we were seeing, and, and getting the information from, from Israel that we couldn't get officially to get unofficially by bringing uh, relevant Israeli witnesses to Geneva and by uh, having our staff interview um, or be between 40 and 50 victims uh, in southern in Israel to be able to get their story to find out what happened. And we were fortunate too in that the mayor of, of Ashkelon came to Geneva uh, to give us more official information. Uh, on the one hand, in a process like this, you have a, a set of uh, existing international norms about the conduct of war. You've talked about them 
uh, uh, proportionality, distinguishing between civ civilian and, uh, and military targets. On, on, the, on the other hand, you have the politics of the situation. I Israel is a more powerful actor. Uh, Hamas, uh, in one of its faces, is a terrorist organization. In another face is a kind of a social uh, welfare organization and so on. And, and then thirdly, you have the history of what has been going on in the region. Uh, Israel's occupation uh, policies, the non-recognition by the Arab states, and so on. So the, the, the mission that you have is really to put all of that together uh, in a judicious way. W what is the struggle there? Because it's not just a question of, of having a set of laws and say, well, this party did mm. this and that party did that. Well, firstly, we had to set the, we, we had to describe the context. And we, we, we tried to do that, I hope, as, as, as evenly as we could. So the, in our report, very long report, the, the context is set in an introduction where we described in a fairly brief chapter what, what, what the history was. Now, probably our version of the history pleased nobody because it wasn't, we tried not to give a partial history and that would have probably annoyed uh, uh, all sides to the, to the equation. Uh, but but our, main, our main task, our central task and the central theme was to have a look at what damage was done to civilian life in Gaza, to civilian infrastructure in Gaza, and what attacks were made on civilians. And I only wish that people, that critics, would have a look at those incidents. I mean, I, I was very moved, to put it mildly, it was a very emotional experience to go to Gaza on two visits to the Gaza Strip and see the, the physical damage done, thousands of private homes destroyed, thousands, well over 5,000 completely destroyed, to see uh, 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 infrastructure, civilian infrastructure, fields plowed up, uh, uh, food factories bombed, um, to, 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 to see that and to meet with the victims is a very emotional experience. I wish everybody in the world could have been there with us and, uh, and experienced the, the, the emotion. And, 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 and these were people who, who were obviously telling us their story. They weren't being put up to it by terrorist organizations. They, we, we interviewed them where these things happened where they were injured, where their loved ones were killed. And, that, and I can assure you that's a very, a very unpleasant uh, experience and one has nightmares about it for the rest of one's life, and I certainly do. And, and uh, in look, reading the report, one discovers that, that you, you have the real voices there of people who uh, might have been used <coughs> as, uh, as shields, as human seals. Uh, people in their homes who found those homes bombed. Uh, and by the way, one should mention that in the report, you actually made every effort to describe the Hamas attacks uh, on Siderut and, and the other right. Israeli towns prior to the war. So in in the end, what what is your hope that, uh, because the, the report, report has been denounced by the Israelis. Uh, and, 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 and denounced by Hamas. Right. Hmm. And, and, but but, the, but the, the, the point here, I guess, is to create a record that may contribute to a change of policies by both parties in the long term, but, but also establish a body of law about the way that to do this in other conflicts that may hmm. not be in hmm. the Middle East. Well, it has, you know, it's, it's, it's it, it, in my view, to the credit of the Israel Defense Force that a substantial number of the incidents that we reported and that others reported have been the subject of investigation. On the other uh, both sides were called upon to investigate what they did. Both sides were told that what they did appeared to be war crimes. Uh, Israel has conducted investigations, I believe too little, some of them may be too late, but, but they have significantly done a lot of investigation. On the other side, there's been absolutely nothing 
I must say, I launched no investigation at all to establish who was responsible for the war crimes that we found it had committed. So I think, I think that, that must be taken into account. Israel, too, has a, a amended to an extent its rules of engagement. I don't believe in future it would use white phosphorus in the way it did, in the very harmful way it did in, uh, in uh, the, the Gaza operation. And I think different, different steps will be taken uh, to, to protect civilians. And, and, and at least that, that, that is a benefit. The, 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 other, the other important aspect which has been ignored, and I understand why, is that this is the first time that the United Nations has condemned as war crimes what the Hamas and other militants did by, by, by directing rocket and mortar fire uh, into, uh, into Israel. And you know, it really is a matter of happenstance that the, that the death and injury toll in Israel isn't, isn't hugely greater than it has been. I mean, had, had some of those rockets hit school, uh, school kindergartens, the, 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 there could have been horrendous uh, consequences. And indeed, very recently, one of the most recent rockets uh, just missed a wedding party. This is um, Hamas's rockets. Uh, Hamas for, rockets, yeah, which yeah. are just missed a wedding party in southern mm -hmm. Israel. So it, 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 it could have been a lot worse. The fact that the death and injury toll has been uh, 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 comparatively low uh, is, is, is pure luck. It could have been a lot worse. And, and, and what's, what I was going to say, what is missed, is that the, in, in the acceptance of our report, by the General Assembly of the United Nations and by the Human Rights Council and by the European Parliament, they've all accepted our condemnation of the Hamas and other militant rockets. And that hasn't happened before. And of course, uh, I believe Israel should be uh, capitalizing on that, but I understand they don't want to, uh, because by doing so, they'll be giving some credibility to the report. Were you surprised by the on hominem attacks on you personally as a way to create a smokescreen for looking at what the commission uh, really did? Absolutely, I didn't. I didn't for a moment anticipate that there would be that sort of ad hominem attack. Obviously, I, I, I anticipated there would be uh, attacks on on the report and on findings and on what we said, but I certainly didn't anticipate the really. Uh, 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 extremely unpleasant ad hominem attacks. One final question. Uh, what should we draw from this, the high points of your distinguished career, which we just touched on? What, what is the one or two lessons uh, that you have learned about building uh, these institutions and shaping these norms so that we move toward an international community uh, bound by international law? Well, the first is to, to, to respect and apply the law. I think, I think that, that, that's important. I think the rule of law is fundamental to democracies, but it's also fundamental to the international community. An international rule of law has been growing and is growing, and we can only be a better world for that. Second, that the, the truth is important. And the, the sooner and more even-handedly the truth can be established, the better for a, situ for a situation, um, certainly in the long term. The truth may cause short-term greater problems, but that's the price one has to pay. You get nothing for nothing in this world, and international justice uh, has a cost. And, and the cost may, it hasn't, thank, thank goodness, it hasn't thus far uh, uh, been, been the result of increased war, but it could be. But that's the cost, and I think at the end of the day, the international community and all of us have to ask ourselves, were we a better world when war criminals had effective impunity? There were no courts that could bring them to book. There were no courts that could investigate or punish. Were we a better world then, or are we a better world now having institutions, domestic and international institutions, that can at least uh, bring acknowledgement and some solace and some justice uh, to the victims? I believe the answer must be yes. Justice Goldstone, on that uh, note, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here with us and to share uh, your experiences. Good. Thank, thank you. you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.